Good morning and welcome to Worship at Grace for June 28th, 2020, part three in our series, Some Better News. My name is Drew McIntyre. I'm the pastor at Grace UNC. We're so glad you joined us and uh, found us online. Uh, this is a little bit different of an opener because on this particular Sunday, I forgot to hit record at the very beginning. Uh, so I've got most of the service live as normal as we recorded it uh, in process. But the opening part of worship, uh, which was uh, some announcements and a song, uh, I forgot to hit record initially. So this is the new opening. Uh, I want to make sure you didn't miss anything from this uh, very special Sunday. So we're going to open uh, this worship service with Lead Me to the Cross. We're so grateful uh, for the uh, the gifts of our music ministry team uh, as they continue to share them um, even in new and different ways and learning creative ways to combine voices uh, we're grateful for that so as we think today about what it means to be a disciple um, lead me to the cross is a great way to prepare our hearts and minds to uh, connect with God and one another today <music> calendars for our next blood drive on Monday, August the 10th. We had a great turnout for our last blood drive 
and uh, one blood wanted to schedule another one. So we had a great turnout both from the community and from our congregation. Uh, so please tell your friends about this. this is the great a great way to serve our neighbors. One Blood is the primary supplier for Moses Cone Health System, and so this is a great way for neighbors to help neighbors. Thank you for your faithfulness in this ministry and for serving our neighbor. Awesome. Thanks so much to uh, the Socially Distanced Music Camp for sharing their gifts, for all of our uh, musicians uh, that are making uh, making this possible for us to continue uh, having great music as we worship. We're so grateful for you sharing your gifts and for that ministry. Uh, we're thankful for that. We're also thankful for, uh, for the gift of uh, Samantha's ministry among us. So we'll turn it over to her and have some children's time here in just a moment. I do want to say a word of thanks especially to the Glasgow family and to everyone that came out yesterday for, uh, for our Spark Fitness Blast. We had, that was our second one of those, uh, those uh, family-friendly workouts, kid workouts that we had yesterday. It was a good time. We got Cora 
uh, kicking and, uh, and doing squats and everything in that. And uh, we had a really fun time. So big thanks to the, the Glasgow's for uh, taking time out of their Saturday to make that possible for us. And uh, hopefully we'll have another one of those coming up soon. That was, that was a lot of fun to do that again. So uh, thanks for that. Here is uh, Samantha. And if the children would gather around, uh, it is their time. Hi everyone, good morning. Um, I hope you guys are doing well and that you guys had an awesome week. Um, thank you so much to those that were able to make it out yesterday to the Spark Fitness Blast. We had so much fun. Um, we got active, we definitely broke out of sweat <laughs> and um, we just had fun together. And so I know some were not able to make it because you may be traveling or you were busy and that's okay. I hope to see you guys in the near future at our next Fitness Blast. So I want you guys to think of a time where you worked really hard for something that you really wanted. Um, so maybe it was that you studied really hard because you wanted to pass a spelling test or a math test or a reading test, or maybe you helped out around the house and you were on your best behavior because you wanted a gift that you asked your parents for. Whatever it is, that is something that was important to you. And so you did your best, you worked hard in order to meet that goal. And that's how it is with Christ. Christ loved us so much, God loved us so much that he did whatever he needed to do in order to bring us back into a relationship with him, in order to, um, to reunite with us. And so even if that meant that Christ had to give up his life and die on the cross for us, he was willing to pay that price. He was willing to do whatever he had to do to reach the ultimate goal of us being able to have a relationship with God. And so it wasn't easy. He definitely had to pay the price. It cost him his whole life, but he loved us that much. We meant that much to him. We mean that much to him that he was willing to do that. So I want you guys to remember that you are so loved and that God is constantly thinking about you and that he was willing to do whatever necessary to have a relationship with you. We, we, we help us to not be scared in this really rough time where lots of people are getting sick. In Jesus name, amen. Amen. That was awesome. Thank you, James. Thank you, Samantha, for that. We're grateful for uh, for their gifts, and uh, we're grateful for uh, for your gifts, um, for uh, for whatever way that you're uh, you're giving uh, gifts, uh, great or small. Whether you're sending a check, whether you're um, giving online, uh, and I'll send that uh, drop that link there in the comments now. Whether you're uh, you have a monthly draft that that comes out, however it is that you give, we're grateful for that. Uh, no, this is a difficult time for uh, for many, uh, and we're uh, we're grateful for uh, those as you continue to give, especially in the summer months, as you're traveling. Um, continuing to to give really really helps us out because the summer months can be can be lean sometimes. So thank you for that. Uh, as we offer our gifts to God this morning, uh, let us uh, have a time of prayer um, where we uh, remember uh, the things that we're grateful for, um, and uh, let's pray together now uh, with the words on the screen. O God, like the lepers healed by Jesus, who did not turn back to thank him, we have too often taken your grace for granted. Grace is free, but it is not cheap. You gave your son for us, so we ask for boldness to give ourselves to you. When you call us, may we hear. Where you lead us, may we go. What you ask of us, may we give. By your spirit, teach us to love all things in you and with you, for your very being is self-giving love. And all God's people said, Amen. Awesome. Well, this morning we are continuing our series, Some Good News, based on uh, John Krasinski's podcast, Some Good News. Uh, the, the theme of the series is that the gospel, the good news of God's grace is better. What's it better than? Name it. It's better than everything. Uh, so how do we live lives that honor that great gift, um, that great love that is ours through Jesus Christ? 
We're going to talk about that some more today. Uh, first, let's hear our scripture this morning. Uh, we're grateful uh, to our electors uh, for their ministry. And uh, we have a new lector with us today, William. Uh, thanks to William for reading scripture for us today. This reading comes from Matthew 19, verses 16 through 22. Then someone came to him and said, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. Also, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, I have kept all these. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, If you wish to be perfect, go, sell your possessions, and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the young man heard this word, he went away grieving, for he had many possessions. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. A powerful, a powerful scripture. A perplexing scripture, too. Uh, let's pray. Living and loving God, as we open up your word this morning, uh, as we hear this, um, this strange lesson from Jesus, uh, maybe even it sounds like a harsh lesson from Jesus, God, make this a word for us this morning. And God, whatever it is that stands between us and fully experiencing your love and your grace, we ask that you would help us to lay it down so that we can follow your son more closely. And this morning, may the words I say, may the meditations on all of our hearts this morning be found pleasing in your sight. For God, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I don't know about you, but I, I think I often take simple things for granted. Uh, take, for instance, clean water. Recently, I have been trying to drink more water. I've never been a great water drinker, but the last couple of weeks, I've set a goal of drinking uh, 100 ounces or more of water a day. And uh, the truth is, it's been a little bit easier than I thought it would be. Um, and I, I feel pretty good. I think I have more more energy. I feel a noticeable difference. Uh, I've had this thing with me pretty much everywhere I go. Um, but it hit me a few days ago how fortunate I am that I can simply decide to drink more water. Right? With a turn of a knob, I have access to all the clean water I want. And that's something that millions of people around the world cannot do. They can't just decide to drink more water. They can't just magically access clean, fresh drinking water. The UN, in fact, estimates that around 700 million people in the world live in severe water scarcity right now, and it's projected to rise in the coming years. Whereas you and I, probably everyone watching this right now, we have such access to clean water that we can use it decoratively if we want to. We have so much clean water that we can use it for decoration. What do you take for granted? Maybe it's not water, maybe it's something else. Uh, we're in the summer now and a lot of people are traveling for vacation. Uh, but you know, odds are wherever you go on vacation, there's someone that lives there who takes it for granted. It's just home. Um, maybe you go to the mountains for vacation. There's people in the mountains that don't even notice the beauty of the mountains anymore. I know people that went, to, went away to school uh, at the coast and uh, now they can't even stand going to the beach because they got so tired of the beach. But this is also true for more consequential things. Um, our daughter, as many of y'all know, is 10 months old. Uh, and every it seems like every month or two or every so often she needs to go in to have another shot or another series of shots. And it's inconvenient to take her to the pediatrician and I hate watching her cry and it's not fun and, and I get annoyed with it sometimes. But if, if this pandemic has taught me anything, it's how valuable and important vaccines are. The shots that I complain about her having to get are miraculous protections from a host of things that previous generations had to deeply and seriously fear. I take those medical advancements for granted. I also wonder, do we sometimes take God's grace 
for granted? Do we take God's love for granted? I think I do sometimes. I think about the, the rushed prayers I've had. The nights when I was too tired to read the Bible, but I had plenty of time to stay up watching several episodes on Netflix. I think about the days that I've spent angry at something petty or foolish, forgetting the many blessings I have. I too often treat grace like a right rather than a gift. Dietrich Bonhoeffer had a name for that attitude. He called it cheap grace. He said this, Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, communion without confession, absolution without personal confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, without the cross, without Jesus Christ, living and incarnate. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. We often talk about grace being free, which it is, but it's also costly because it took Jesus to the cross. And likewise, when we follow Jesus, there is a cost. Take this story from Matthew, for instance. Jesus is approached by a very uh, sincere young man. Now we're told he's young and a lot of times in depictions, he's like a teenager, but young in this context could mean anything from kind of mid twenties to about 40. No offense to anyone watching this, that's just what the Bible scholar I read uh, about this passage uh, said. Uh, so somewhere mid twenties to around 40. Um, he's young, he's wealthy, he's a good person. Um, he's not some kind of notorious sinner He's someone that comes to Jesus with a sincere question. And this is his question. Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Or some translations say, what good deed must I do to get eternal life? Now, Jesus doesn't treat this question lightly. Jesus doesn't dismiss him. He says, you know what you're supposed to do. Follow the commandments. And this sincere, rich, young guy sa sincerely says, uh, which ones? And Jesus quotes from the, the second half of the Ten Commandments, the ones that deal with loving your neighbor. Um, you know, and he says, I've done all these since I was a kid. I, I've honored my parents. I haven't murdered. I haven't, I haven't stolen. I love my neighbor as myself. And then here comes the hard part. The young man said to him, I have done all of these what do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you wish to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. When the young man heard this word, he went away grieving for he had many possessions. He went away grieving for he had many possessions. Now, I, I love this passage, uh, even though it's a little bit difficult I love this passage because this is one that I point to when someone tells me that they uh, they believe in the Bible literally, that every word is literally true because almost no one actually lives the literal truth of this, of this passage, right? And I don't mean that to be dismissive. I just mean that it immediately sort of threatens us. Like I'm, I'm sure just reading that story, hearing that story, uh, something inside you got bunched up. Our, our, our first instinct is to explain it away. Right? Well, this was just Jesus teaching for this one person. It doesn't apply to, to everyone. Or, um, well, this, this person was rich, so this was about his greed. I'm not rich, so this is not, not about me. Or, uh, well, I, I can't be perfect. I'm not trying to be perfect, so I should just ignore this. But I, I think we should resist that temptation to kind of distance ourselves from it that easily. I think we should take it a little more seriously than that. What I think the message of this passage is, is this. Grace is free from God, but should not be cheap to us. Grace is free from God, but should not be cheap to us. Think again about what Jesus said to the young man. Sell your possessions, give the money to the poor, and then follow me. Now, what's amazing about this passage is that 
as best as I can tell, this is the only time in the Gospels where, where Jesus directly asks someone to follow him and they refuse. You think about the call stories of the disciples, they all came when they were asked. And they left behind things also, not, not great wealth, but their families, their homes, their, their jobs, their careers. They, they dropped their fishing nets to follow Jesus. Matthew, the author of this gospel, had been a tax collector, which was a, a, a corrupt job, but a, a lucrative job. All those disciples dropped something significant to follow Jesus. But when he was asked to, this rich young ruler could not. Grace is free from God, but it should not be cheap to us. It would be tempting now to, to jump to something like, so how do we live like this? What do we do with this? How do we not take God's grace for granted? And I, I don't want to get there, but I want to come at it from a little, a little different way. Because I want to invite us to think about, not so much about what God wants from us, but what God wants for us. So not what God, you know, not just automatically jump to what stuff do I need to do to make God happy. That's the wrong way to think about grace. Think about what God wants for you. Remember the question that the young man asked Jesus. What good thing must I do to get eternal life? Eternal life. Um, two things here to, to notice. He was asking about eternal life. Now, when we hear eternal life, we tend to think of heaven. Uh, we tend to think of the afterlife. And, and that's true, but it's, it's more than that. Because eternal life in the Gospels is the life of the kingdom. It's the life of the world to come. And in his teaching throughout the Gospels, Jesus is, Jesus is clear that the kingdom is not just something that is in the future, but it's also something that we get to experience at least partially, right here and right now. So whether he knew that he was asking this or not, the young man was asking how to experience the kingdom of God in the present. That leads to the second observation. If this is a conversation about, about how to embrace the kingdom, how to experience it here and now, then Jesus' commands to the young man makes a whole lot more sense. Because he wasn't asking the young ruler to pay his way into heaven. He was asking him to let go of what he most valued so that he could fully experience God's kingdom. A New Testament professor named Craig Keener, who teaches at Asbury, said this about this passage. He said, the kingdom is all-consuming. The kingdom is all-consuming. The rich young ruler was not ready to give up everything for the kingdom, and that's precisely what God asks of all of his disciples, right? What you value most is what you worship. And so Jesus is always pushing disciples, where is your heart? What do you value most? Where is your treasure? Because that is what you worship. God asks everything from us because what he has for us is so much better if we have hands and hearts open to receive it. Dallas Willard, who's someone I've learned a great deal from, I love Dallas Willard's work, um, has written about what he calls the cost of non-discipleship. I love Bonhoeffer. I love talking about costly grace, and I find that that book and that concept so valuable. But Willard, I think Willard's point about the cost of non-discipleship, what we miss out by not being disciples, is huge. Uh, so Willard said this, non-discipleship costs abiding peace, a life penetrated throughout by love, faith that sees everything in the light of God's overriding governance for good, hopefulness that stands firm in the most discouraging of circumstances, power to do what is right and withstand the forces of evil. In short, it costs exactly that abundance of life Jesus said he came to bring in John 10, verse 10. Friends, I believe that this identity as a disciple is crucial to becoming who God wants us to be, who God desires for us to be, and enjoying the life that God wants to give us, that God wants to give to you. I recently read a, a really fantastic um, new book, 
new-ish, I think it came out a year ago, a book called um, Atomic Habits by James Clear. And I'm really enjoying putting, putting some of those principles um, to, to work. It's a book about habits and how small, tiny habits can make big changes throughout the course of your life. And one of his key insights in the book is that we live our lives from the inside out. But too often we try to reverse that process when we're trying to make changes. So we, we try to get a better job in order to buy a nicer car. We try to lose weight for the class reunion. Uh, or we, we do our homework only because we want a good grade uh, and we want to get into a certain school. But what Clear argues convincingly in the book is that we, we sabotage ourselves when we tie our goals to outcomes rather than identity. So he has this, uh, this chart in the book that there are three layers of behavior change. And that the central layer and the first layer, the most important layer, is this inner layer of identity. So he argues that we should begin by deciding who we want to be, our identity, and then proving that new identity to ourselves with small and continuous wins. His argument is that if you change your identity, you'll change your life. If you focus on outcomes, you might get temporary change, but if you focus on identity, the outcomes and the processes will naturally follow from that. This is why I think the identity as a disciple is so important. Um, I don't know where exactly I got this, but I, I began the shift in my own thinking um, probably four or five years ago, something like that. Um, I no longer like calling myself a Christian in terms of how I conceive of myself. If someone asks me, what's your religion? Okay, sure, it's Christianity, but who am I? I'm oh, a Christian. A Christian is a static identity, right? It sounds like I have arrived. I prefer to think of myself as a follower of Jesus, right? That's something I'm continually doing. It's not an end state to which I've arrived at. Uh, besides which, Christians often let me down, right? Christians often will let you down. Jesus never does. Similarly, I think Jesus is very clear that he came to make us disciples, not believers. The Great Commission is to go and make disciples. And I think deep down, we, we know why that's important. It's because we, we know that you can be a believer and not be transformed. You can check off all the right beliefs in your head and yet not be transformed. And I say that as someone that I love theology, I love Christian beliefs and teachings and the creeds and all that stuff. I really deeply care about it but it's not everything. We know too well from history that there were believers who checked off all the right beliefs, but who owned other human beings and beat them and murdered them and even worse. We know that there were believers, there were baptized Christians who sent Jews into gas chambers. You can be a believer and not be transformed. On the other hand, I think a disciple, a disciple is always growing. A disciple is uh, always subjecting her or his life to Christ's teaching and example. You can't be a disciple and not be transformed. Friends, if, if you want to embrace costly grace, if you want that eternal quality of life that God desires for you, begin by shifting your identity. You're not primarily a Christian or a believer or a member. You're a disciple. You're becoming an active follower of Jesus. What does that look like? What are some practical changes that identity shift might make in your life? Here's a few. Think about prayer. A Christian prays occasionally. Definitely when there's an emergency, maybe at mealtimes, but a disciple praise daily and regularly, both for themselves and for others. A disciple prays daily. Think about service. A church member sees service as optional. A member is free to volunteer or not when they want to, when it, you know, it's what they want to do, when they feel up to it. A follower of Jesus is a servant just like Jesus was a servant. They know that service is not optional, but central 
to the life of Jesus followers. Think about scripture and Bible study and small groups. A believer probably has a Bible or two around the house, but they don't get used very often. If you're a believer, if you already believe, what more is there to learn? A believer sees small groups as optional. I already believe, so why do I need others if we already believe the same things? What value is that? A disciple, on the other hand, sees the Bible as God's love story and continually seeks God's grace through that word. A disciple does this in community with others, knowing that we grow best, we grow most alongside others. As the Bible tells us, iron sharpens iron. Think about giving. A Christian gives what is convenient when it's convenient. They don't see finances as connected to their spiritual life. They separate their checkbook from their prayer life. Uh, they separate their money from their worship. A follower of Jesus, on the other hand, gives regularly and sacrificially. Jesus followers know that everything is God's and that what they give has everything to do with what they value and in whom or what they place their trust. The life of the disciple is the kingdom life, the eternal kind of life that Jesus invites everyone to. It's not an easy life. It's not a kind of life that we stumble into on accident. It's a life that runs on God's grace and not on our goodness. It's a life that forgives even the nastiest people. It's a life that is aimed at the things of God and not simply personal comfort. In short, it's a life that only makes sense if the gospel is true. That's the life of someone who's not just a believer, not just a semi-practicing Christian, but a deeply faithful, still flawed, but trying, active disciple of Jesus. Grace is free from God, but should not be cheap to us. What would this shift in identity and practice mean for us as a church? I think it makes all the difference in the world. For one thing, this is what our mission statement lays out about what our purpose is uh, as a community. Our purpose, our mission is to empower disciples to follow Jesus and to engage with our neighbors as servant leaders, keeping all the while our, our vision, our vision of God's renewal of Greensboro and the world at the forefront of our ministry. A church of disciples changes lives. A church of members, I think, is a group of people who receive benefits, right? You're a member of the country club. You're a member of the Jelly of the Month club. You're a member of something. You expect to get something from it. A disciple expects to give rather than to receive. Jesus only had 12 disciples. They were all unreliable. They were all sinners. They all messed up frequently. One of them betrayed Jesus spectacularly. His name was Judas. And yet that group of 11 went on to change the world. Friends, a small group of disciples will do more for the kingdom than a stadium full of believers. The gospel is the greatest gift there is. There is no better news. It is better than anything else. So let's treasure it. Let's honor it. Let's live by it and live for it. I don't think anyone watching this wants to be uh, just, a, just a Christian, just a believer. I think that you know that God wants more for you than to just be the member of a club. God wants to give you the eternal kind of life, this new and different quality of life, the life that comes from laying our lives down at Jesus' feet, hearing his call and following him. Let's not take that call for granted. Let's not take that grace, that marvelous, wonderful, amazing grace for granted anymore. Grace is free from God, but should not be cheap to us. Let's pray. Gracious God, in the story of the rich young ruler, we see someone more like us than we'd like to admit someone who's been fortunate in life, someone with a lot of blessings, someone who sincerely kind of wants something more 
but maybe isn't quite willing to take that next step. God, you, you call us all differently. But whatever our life looks like as a disciple, you call us to give of ourselves. You call us to decrease in ourselves so that you may increase in us. So God, whatever it is that stands between us and fully experiencing your kingdom, whatever it is that we're holding on to that we need to let go of, we pray for the courage, for the wisdom to lay that down so that we can fully embrace your son Jesus and follow more faithfully. We thank you that you've called us not, not just to be Christians, not just to be members, not just to be believers, but to be disciples. And we pray for the courage, the conviction to change that identity so that our lives with Jesus might be a constant and ever-growing, joyful life. Let all God's people say, Amen. <laughs> I, so, <laughs> Y'all like the Jelly of the Month Club. I don't know where that came from. I hadn't written that down. It just came to me. Uh, go, go figure. I've never been in a Jelly of the Month Club. It sounds fun. I mean, if you like jelly, I guess. Um, anyway. Uh, we're going to close with a, a wonderful hymn. We're thinking about what it means to follow Jesus, the cost of discipleship. Uh, one of the great, uh, great hymns uh, of the faith, one of the great hymns in our hymnal is Lift High the Cross. We're grateful to members of our, of our choir uh, for making uh, this beautiful song for us today. Lift high the cross, the love of Christ proclaim, till all the world adore His sacred name. Come, Christians, follow His triumphant sign, the host of God. She combined, lift high the cross, the love of Christ proclaim, till all the world adore His sacred name. Each newborn servant of the crucified. On the brow, the seal of him who died, lift I the cross, the love of Christ proclaim, till all the world adore his sacred name.
what a gift that uh, that is. Beautiful, beautiful hymn. Thanks to uh, our choir for making that possible for us. Um, as we uh, draw to a close here, uh, a reminder for the prayer requests we've lifted up. One other to be aware of, uh, Stefan, our office manager. Stefan's dad has been in the hospital, and Stefan's been doing a lot of care for, uh, for his dad and uh, for his family. So we pray for Stefan's dad as well. Uh, today, uh, uh, let us uh, let us close in prayer. Living and loving God, for this day and this time, we give you thanks for all the gifts that have made this time of worship possible. For all those God watching right now, for all those who will watch this uh, later on when it's recorded, we're grateful for them. We pray God for your continuing, transforming presence of your Holy Spirit in our lives, uh, God. You called us to be not just believers, not just passive Christians, not just members of a club, but you've called us to be disciples. Uh, so God, make us more faithful as disciples of your son, Jesus, that we might receive uh, everything that you have to give us. God, make us willing to lay down what needs to be laid down to do so. We give these things to you. We offer ourselves to you in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Remember tonight, uh, our community conversation uh, will be uh, at 7, uh, maybe till 8 o'clock, maybe till 7.45 with Dr. Kling. He's been with us before, a very important topic. We'll have some fellowship here in just a minute via Zoom. Um, uh, Joe posted the link there in the comments if you need it. And let me know today. Uh, send me a message, text, email uh, if you want a yard sign because we got to order those tomorrow. If you have questions, uh, see the email uh, from Friday or just shoot me a message. Uh, and we uh, are grateful for that, that ministry. Friends, receive this blessing. It's been good to be with you this morning. Let me send you off with a blessing. Benediction means good words. So let me send you off with some good words. You were made for more than just being a believer. You were made for more than just being a passive Christian. You were made for more than just being a member who gets benefits. You were made to follow the one who is life itself. You are made to follow the crucified carpenter, the resurrected son of God. His name is Jesus. Friends, grace is free from God, but it should not be cheap to us. Let us go forth and live as disciples. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Alleluia. And all God's people said, Amen.